Welcome back to our Tridelphia YouTube Sabbath School. And we are so happy you are joining us for the last lesson of this quarter. Lesson 13, and it's a step in faith. And maybe this word faith also um, has as part of its meaning the idea of faithfulness. The word is not going to go to the entire world unless you and I participate in sharing it. But before we begin our lesson, we're going to start with a word of prayer. And thank you for bowing your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gift of life. And we thank you for this opportunity to share the Sabbath school lesson together. I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher and will guide us to all that is true and that you, what you want us to do um, in sharing the good news to others. We ask your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we get into the lesson, I don't have a computer here mm -hmm. to kind of have that interaction to know what kind of questions we're getting. But you can text a Google Voice number, 269-815-8808. And then if you have a question, I'll get it here, and then we can add that to our discussion. Okay. So 269-815-8808. All right, carry on. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> so, so why don't we start with our Sabbath School um, memory text, okay. which says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is found in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. And I think the lesson, again, reminds us the only way we're going to be able to witness to others about Jesus is if the Holy Spirit, Jesus' mind, Jesus' thoughts, Jesus' teachings that are in the Bible are something we understand, we're acquainted with, and not just acquainted, but that we practice, we live. Mm. We, we, it's part of who we are. And I believe um, Paul understood this in a very real way. He had this conversion experience where at one moment he was persecuting the Christians. And now he's the greatest evangelist history has ever known. And how does that happen? How does someone like Paul become a witness? How does someone like Peter, who was a fisherman, become a witness for Jesus? How does John, who was also a fisherman, or a Matthew, who was a tax collector, or you and me, how do we become a witness? Or you who are watching us? And I think this is a beautiful lesson inviting us to be something God made us um, to do. And that is to share his amazing love with others. I think something we have to remember is mm -hmm. nothing happens overnight. Okay. That's a good... And yes. or without pain. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, Paul first, mm -hmm. who was Saul. Mm -hmm. He had a whole experience, yes. which I don't really... Um, I don't wish on other people. Uh -huh. You know, he... He was so devout, but devout in the wrong way. Yes. And it took him literally being blinded and mm -hmm. alone for a few days to re hit the reset button. Mm -hmm. Peter, you mentioned. Yes. Um, he had, well, he thought he had it all together. Mm -hmm. And then one weekend he realized he didn't have it all together. Mm -hmm. And that really brought him down. Okay. So... Some so when it is talking about let this, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus in Philippians 2, um, it, and going on to verse 7, it mm -hmm. talks about making himself of no reputation, taking mm -hmm. upon him the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Um, it, it takes a humble heart for, for God to be able to um, take us to the next level. Amen. And then I think that that is an important point. The only way God can use you and me is if we are willing to surrender our will to Him. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you want someone to do something for you and you specifically tell them this is what you would like them to do, but then they have another idea or what they think is a better idea and then things don't work out as, as, as planned. So 
we go back to the idea there is a God who created the heavens and the earth, who knows the end from the beginning, and who sees you and me as his chosen vessels. And what an awesome privilege, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah. To be able to be these ambassadors for Jesus. So when mm -hmm. you're talking about a step in faith, mm -hmm. how does somebody take that first step? Mm -hmm. That's, That's a well, great question. Like, where, where's the beginning of this process? And, and maybe it starts before we make that first step mm -hmm. by knowing who Jesus is. Okay. And if we go to um, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, if you have your Bibles, let's open it quickly to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. So you see I have this Bible here. Uh, I just literally <laughs> grabbed it off the shelf. Um, my confession cool this morning is I, I didn't bring my Bible with me. I was okay. like, I'm doing camera work. I'm teaching people how to do camera. And then this morning I looked over the bookshelf, and this reminds me of my first Bible, which Amen. was one of these. I, I got it at the end of an evangelistic series children's meeting. Cool. <laughs> and uh, I think I still have it. No, that's an but, awesome Bible. And, and that invites us to also... Um, it's, Children can be some of the best witnesses for Jesus and that they know who he is and they put into practice those things that they learn. Matthew we, 4? 4, verses 18 through 20. And if okay. you could read it for us. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Wow, that's pretty bold right there. So modern day example, <laughs> you're working with your family on a, on a landscaping or garden project uh, in the back. Jesus walks down your street and he says, uh, follow me. Correct. And literally you just take off your gloves. And you follow. And you're like, bye. That's just, it seems like a, a bit strong. It does. In today's standards, like... We don't just leave things. We kind of tie up loose ends, right? Correct. Or, or, or we don't. What's, what's going on here? And, and maybe what's going on here is that John, Peter, Andrew had heard already about Jesus. Hmm. They had heard that this man spoke like no other man, that this man had authority like no other um, person they knew. And when they heard Jesus speak, directly to them and tell them, I will make you fishers of men. Wow! I can imagine them thinking, that sounds interesting. That sounds great. That sounds like a high calling. And I want to do that. And you also have to wonder their mindset at that point. Mm. Did they think that maybe it would lead to earthly glories later? Mm. Or did they think immediately... Because mm -hmm. to get that fishers of men, you, you see fishers of men here, but then later, kind of at the end of the story, after the Gospels are over, he, he, taught, he brings back that re fishers of men reference. Yes. And maybe that just cued back to the start of their journey, and they could see and then trace throughout his ministry, uh, the plan for them going forward. Yes, I, I think you're, you're right, Peter. Um, they probably at first saw something for themselves. That's very human, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When we're going to do something, we see something that is early, in it for... early adopters in technology. Yes. Like, uh, as far as me, it's been Kickstarter projects. Okay. So, uh, a new piece of technology that comes out that helps the computer or audio or maybe a new bicycle something that just seems different and 
the, the people have gone for their funding and they're pitching it for crowdfunding. And if you get this new thing, uh, you're an early adopter. Mm -hmm. And if you're an early adopter in the tech world, it seems like something that's, oh, they had such and such first. Mm -hmm. And in, in certain things, like uh, in social media, for instance, there was MySpace first, and then there was Facebook, and then there were the early adopters of Facebook. Now there's, and then there's early adopters of Instagram. Mm -hmm. And oh, you were one of the first, or, or on Twitter, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, people have their Twitter birthdays. Oh, I've been on Twitter for 10 years, and wow. you've only been on for five years. So <laughs> like, like the, the, there's, there's some of that aspect, but it's still, needed to take some faith for them to just mm -hmm. jump out and be like they had they had a good business they mm -hmm. had their boats they had all the equipment for it and literally they left the key mm -hmm. um, and there would have had to be some type of strongness of faith or something because mm -hmm. and the second example here they're leaving their father as yes. well and if you think about how um, we relate to our parents and wanting to um, make them proud and, and mm -hmm. um, have them behind us in what we do, and you know, I can just see the fathers mentoring them in into the ways of fishing, mm -hmm. and then one day they're gone. Mm -hmm. So these decisions imply sacrifice, right? Yeah. There, there is a cost. There is a cost to following Jesus. There is something we will need to leave behind. And this might be a job. This might be a family member. This might be somebody who's so close to us, but that is pulling us in the other direction. And this is where they had to make a decision. Matthew also, who was a tax collector, and his story is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And um, he also was invited by Jesus. And it seemed like at that moment he... He made the same decision. But again, he must have heard about Jesus. He must have seen something about the message that Jesus was sharing with the people that attracted him to him and said, yes, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I don't want to continue collecting taxes for Rome. Yeah. I want to do something But it was paying better. well. It was paying well. Yeah. yeah. So he, he had that going for him. Mm -hmm. But maybe he didn't see, maybe that wasn't enough for him. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, but you look at our early pioneers mm -hmm. from our church. Yeah. They sacrifice so much. They sacrifice family. Do you, do you remember the potato farm story? No. Tell okay. me about so, it. So <laughs> I don't remember names. So y'all are going to have to write those in the comments. Mm -hmm. But um, there was, as the whole movement was going towards 1843 and 1844. There were um, these Millerite believers that were so focused on getting the message out mm -hmm. that they left their, their potato farm just <laughs> to go, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they weren't going to harvest it or anything. And, um, you know, the disappointment came and went, and they were disappointed. But after... They went to check on the potatoes. I guess maybe they were like, well, I guess we got to continue. Where do we start? So maybe they go back to the field thinking, well, at least we got to clear this out for next year. But all the potatoes were still fine. Amen. Amen. Again, you're going to have to either text me what the name of those people are or you're going <laughs> to have to uh, write that in the comments. But, you know, there's, there's different faith stories of sacrifice. Yes. Joseph Bates. Um, when he gets down to the last coin mm -hmm. and his wife asks him to go get groceries and he literally goes and gets those right. specific items and she's like you know what me when i go to the grocery store uh -huh. <laughs> and i have two things on my list i end up coming, coming home with about 10 because i'm yeah. i'm like oh you know what i need that too <laughs> and we could add that to such mm -hmm. and such we need more basil for the spaghetti mm -hmm. whatever you know so but he literally gets those two items and then he's gone and his, when he comes home again, his wife says, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. You literally got just the two things I asked for. And he said, well, that was the last bit. Mm -hmm. You know, Bates was printing these tracks. Mm -hmm. and he, was, he was so um, into spreading the message Amen. that, yeah, sacrifices were made. is in history. It's mm -hmm. not just back in the, in Bible. the Bible. It's now, and he, even now... Um, Every few mission spotlights or 
mission stories you see. There's an element of, of great sacrifice. There is. Another story that the lesson brings out is found in Acts chapter 9. And this is the story you were talking about, Paul, um, as he's going to Damascus. Mm -hmm. And he has this encounter with Jesus. And he had probably heard about Christians and Christ, but had not paid attention to the message at all. He was yeah. persecuting them at that moment of his life. So he wasn't interested in being a follower of Jesus, but he has this amazing encounter. And this is where Jesus tells him, where he asked the question first, um, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then he, Jesus tells him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. This is verse five of Acts chapter nine. Um, he receives these instructions after recognizing that the voice that was speaking to him, the person that was speaking to him was actually Jesus. Mm. And, and that must have just made him rethink his purpose in life. Well, and it's, it's interesting because it seems like he knew the Lord okay. ahead of time. Okay. But when he's having this situation, he also kind of knows what's happening. Uh-huh. He does. <laughs> and like, Everything is coming together in his mind at this point. And he still asks, who are you, Lord? Yes. And then comes the question that was probably in the back of his mind, but he didn't want to admit, mm -hmm. I am Jesus, mm -hmm. the, who you have persecuted. And that so. probably happens to a lot of us, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, Where yeah. we know exactly what is it that God is trying to tell us, but many times we find an excuse to maybe ask the question, what is it that you want me to do? Really, is this something you want me to do? Okay, I'll do it. And so we find that um, Saul was told um, to basically go to, this, um, to Damascus and find there a certain disciple named Ananias. And that's verse 10. And I'll, I'll read a little bit so, so that we know the context of what we are talking about. Um, and to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And that, that, that caught my attention. Here you have Saul who's had this encounter with Jesus, who's thinking what is the next step. He hasn't heard what it is, but he's praying. Yeah, He's praying and saying, God, I want to do your will. And sorry, sorry for doing the wrong thing and, and going my own way. And then verse 12 tells us, And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. But then Ananias, of course, answered and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Hmm. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I'm sure that was easy. As soon as, as soon as God gave him that, he was like, yeah, I got, I'm on it, Lord. No, right? no. it wasn't. I mean, you got to think of it like, if you, depending on what time period, whether it's the chief inquisition person in the Spanish Inquisition uh -huh. and the Huguenots are trying to get away. Or, you know, like yes. there's, there's lots of little storybooks about different things you read along the way. Um, but this was a guy who was killing. And just imagine if... We're in a modern day, and you had a, a, mm. an, an individual, I'm gonna, I'll name him Saul, just because it That's, works with the situation. Yes. But if you have Saul, and he's, he's eradicated the churches in the Midwest, mm. and he has come to the D.C. metro area, mm. and you've, you hear that he's, he has plans to start eradicating the churches in this area, and you haven't heard about his situation on the road, mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't know that he's blind mm -hmm. and you yeah, uh, well until you're kind of getting this this information now like you don't know what it means by receiving sight but 
Okay, he's blind. So you're getting some of the puzzle pieces, but you don't know the whole situation. So, but you're, you're commanded to go to this guy, Saul. He's in such and such a street in Washington, D.C. at this boutique hotel. Mm -hmm. Go to him and, like, lay your hands on him. That, I mean, I'm right assuming <laughs> that Saul still had his group of men around uh -huh. him. So his Secret Service or uh -huh. his whatever. Companions. His companions his, and warriors. Like, are with him. Taking care how of how intimidating is that? Mm -hmm. But um, I was just noticing. So back in verse six, mm -hmm. um, we have um, Saul, and the Lord says to him, "Arise and go to the city, mm -hmm. and it, it's going to be told you what what's going to happen." And then now in in verse eleven, we also have "Arise and go to the street." called straight. Mm -hmm. So there, there's something in this story, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of paralleling, where you have Saul asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then you have um, Ananias. Ananias saying, here I am, Lord. What do you want me to do? And then how this story unfolds. Ananias could have not imagined mm -hmm. that Paul wrote a bunch of the New Testament in the mm -hmm. future. And this is like the only situation where we, we see Ananias. That's right. He's that's, like just for just, that, but that yeah. one seed and listening made the difference and doing something so dangerous mm -hmm. made all that difference. Amen. And this is again a reminder that God can use any one of us, can use you, can use me. And, and maybe it's just for one moment. And it's for a very difficult task that will require sacrifice. But by God's grace, through the power of his Holy Spirit, um, we praise God that Ananias was willing to go and, and to lay his hands upon Paul. And the reason, again, is that God had chosen him as a special vessel. And, and, and I think that that makes a big difference. When we know that God has chosen someone as a special vessel, mm -hmm. um, then who am I to say no? Yeah. Um, so my wife texted me and she said the potato uh, patch farmer was Leonard Hastings. Okay. So if you want to learn more about that, look up the name Hastings. It's probably Brother Hastings. <laughs> and if you want to ask questions about what we're talking about, you can text the number 269-815-8808. We can integrate your questions into this study here. Amen. And maybe something that we find in this story just to... to, to finish this part is that Paul was called not for an easier life, mm -hmm. not for a better life in our way of seeing things, not for some type of, you know, promotion in some way. In fact, he would have more enemies than I think any other Christian had at that time. And he was willing, he was willing to move forward, even if it would cost him his life. And if you read here or in Acts of the Apostles or any other books about the rest of Paul's life mm -hmm. going forward, it wasn't easy. No. Like, um, he was escaping from people. He mm -hmm. had some time by himself, a few years in Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that was his rebuilding process mm -hmm. of rebuilding his faith. But there, there's some gaps that we don't know about. And we don't know how his walk grew, but when he does come back, he's this, this powerful, powerful missionary for, for God who, in the end, gives his life. He does. And, and why don't we go to the last chapter of the book of Acts, chapter 28, because it gives us just a little taste of, of what he had to go through at the end of his life. You would think, you know, someone who's worked so hard to share the good news with others, he's going to have a happy ending, mm. um, but it, it works out the other way, and you find this in verse 28 through 30, and Peter, would you read that for us? Um, Acts 28, uh -huh. 28 through 30. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. And then the verse 31 too, sorry. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which 
concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Mm-hmm. So it seems like house arrest, mm-hmm. but no one was forbidding him. Mm-hmm. So he could, like, he could he, preach. He could continue that ministry. Amen. Amen. So in the future, if you're stuck under house arrest, just remember you can still do ministry. Amen. And and that again reminds us of of the 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 word um, a step in faith. Mm-hmm. Yes, the, yeah. he took this step in faith. Yeah. And even though he's under confinement, he's under these restrictions. He's not afraid to share his faith with those who come and ask. And there was dispute. Some people left him there and said, no, we're not going to follow you. But there were others who seemed to have come and and learned it. He did this with confidence. And I think the word faith and confidence go together. Yes. So which comes first? Mm. (laughs) That's a good question. (laughs) Because you need faith to have confidence. Yes. But then confidence needs an aspect of faith. Yes. So I think that's a chicken and the egg. Yes, thing. it is. Um, but how, how do we get to that point? How do we get to that point to have that confident faith? Mm-hmm. And, and maybe the, the answer goes back to the experience of Paul, the experience of Peter, the experience of John, the experience of Matthew. Um, they saw and heard it. It was really something that was real to them. It wasn't a made-up story. It wasn't some distant um, idea or concept or theory. It was real. And when something becomes real, then you can like, do something with it. And Jesus was real to all these men and to many women as well who shared the good news in the first century. And, you know, I, I wonder... Um this whole situation Mm -hmm. with Paul and Saul, I wonder if the angels had questions about how this Mm -hmm. was going to pan out. Mm -hmm. God could see the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He could see the second Timothy four, seven, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. God could see that a lot of the, the new Testament is written by this individual, but in the first little bit, it's like, what do we see in this individual? Mm -hmm. And that goes to us too That's right. when we're looking at people, people. we really ha- have to be careful because we, we find ourselves judging all these mm-hmm. people oh, he's not going to be he's mm-hmm. not going to be good for that mm-hmm. no mm-hmm. no and then mm-hmm. like later you find out something wow. or mm-hmm. later we might not know because we missed that opportunity mm-hmm. so i think we have to be in tune with with christ to have those ex- those ananias experiences but then later on when that person has done so much more, we can't beat up on ourselves. No, we can't. Because, like, I, I don't know. He, Ananias might have died in persecution. Um, mm-hmm. I think if we were to look up some research, I know there's research on all, all, how all the disciples died. I think all mm-hmm. of them died through some type of murder, mm-hmm. except John. Correct. So I think for the early New Testament, we don't, we don't hear about him, but I feel confident somehow that he never felt bad about what happened with the Saul and how no. Saul, who turned Paul, took, ended up taking a lot of the glory, per se, mm-hmm. in ministry. And Paul was still very humble, so I'm not saying he took the glory, mm-hmm. but I mean, he just, he just took it so much farther and so much more beyond. Mm-hmm. And maybe... That education background that mm-hmm. he had helped him open some doors for open him. Open the, the doors and mm-hmm. his writing mm-hmm. to bring the clarity of these letters and epistles mm-hmm. to so, the church. But, but God knew that all from the beginning. And he did. And, and it's beautiful. And, and I think that shows us again that God has a plan. And if we are open and, and humble um, to follow his plan at the end, things will work out. And that's probably the, the most difficult part for me is that, that first step, make, taking that first step. And once I take that first step, then the second step just gets a little easier. And then the third one to the point where we see here, Paul's like, I'm going to run this race till the very end. I'm not giving up. Yeah, yeah. Even if it costs me my life, I'm going to run the race. And, and beautiful, beautiful 
um, life that that he. Could we could we turn to Second Corinthians? Yes. Let's go to Second Corinthians five. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Let's see here, Second Corinthians five, and verse fourteen. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read that one? I'll or? be glad to. So Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen, yep. and it tells us the following: For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus. That if one died for all, then all died. Hmm. So, what about this compelling? So, the compelling, I think this is foundational for any disciple of Jesus. Foundational for anyone who wants to be a witness for Jesus. Um, if it comes to me, my strength, my motives, my own um, goals will not make me take that step. It won't. But if love, and it's the love of Christ, mm -hmm. is the foundation of all that I do, and those steps will happen and, and, and will take place. And I think that's something that we, we find again in our lesson when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and inviting them to, to take care of the flock and this is specifically with Peter yes and, yeah. and 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 as you mentioned well you know they begin fishing they end up fishing again because they're discouraged and Jesus comes and invites Peter again to be a fisher of men but he calls him to um, to love him mm -hmm. first Peter you want to take care of my people you first have to love me do you see that that little parallel or a story clincher of, of Peter's, um, kind of his journey. Yes. And at the end of Act 3 of the part you see there. Yes. Uh, of Peter when he's in life with Jesus. Because he had a whole other ministry once Jesus had gone back to heaven. But mm -hmm. this is kind of concluding the first segment. The first segment, um, correct. If we were doing a documentary on the life of Peter, this uh -huh. would be the last part of part one of documentary. Part two is a completely different it's Peter. It's a different Peter, correct. So that's Filled like, with the that's Holy like a sequel. But, yes. so, um, but I like how the lesson says Christianity is not primarily giving up bad things so mm. that we can be saved. Jesus did not give up mm -hmm. bad things in heaven so that he could be saved. Um, he gave up good things so that others could be saved. Jesus does not invite us merely to give of our time, talent, and treasures mm -hmm. to his cause. He invites us to give our lives. Amen. And so back to what I was saying with Peter, yes. he has, there's this, this clincher of, of the three times because Peter pretty much completely messed up his opportunity um, uh, and he cursed, he used language that we don't mm -hmm. want to use and he, it was just a bad situation mm -hmm. and that really affected him. It so he, he just goes back to fishing. He's yes. like, I'm done. I can't do ministry. <laughs> ministry is over. It's too difficult. Nope. We're done. Yes. And that was that was hard. I'm gonna be in, you know, therapy for the rest of my life oh. about the whole situation. Uh -huh. But then we have Jesus coming back into the picture. Amen. And he he kind of just he knows the whole situation, and Peter knows he knows the whole situation, but I think he forgets it for a moment because he's just happy to see Jesus alive. Amen. And then let's let's go here to John John twenty twenty one yeah. verses fifteen through there? nineteen. I'm there. All right, I'm, I'll catch up. Okay, go ahead and start reading. <laughs> so John twenty one verses fifteen through nineteen. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You know, I, I kind of envision this happening mm -hmm. over like a half hour period of time. Mm -hmm. They're like, they're talking and eating. Jesus had prepared the, the food. 
and he kind of pitches him the question. We don't have time frames here, but I like to think it is over a few minutes. Yes, it and, was. And like at the at the at the end, you know, it really hits Peter mm -hmm. uh, the three times. I think because he just, uh, I don't know. I imagine him breaking down. He's like, Lord, you know, because <laughs> Jesus knew about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, denying him three times. The verse continues on with verse 18 and 19. Yeah. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Mm -hmm. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I, 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 I can't imagine the thoughts and feelings Peter was having at that moment. On the one side, he, he's grateful that Jesus is calling him back to ministry, basically, um, feeding his flock, um, leading his flock. And something, like you said, in part two of Peter's story, mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible, completely different, completely Peter. different Peter. He's, he's, he's leading God's people, baptizing 3,000 first, then 5,000. And, and, and we can go on and on with all the things that he did. But here we find a, a Peter who's humble. Again, he has the mind of Jesus now, and he recognizes, I don't have the answers. I thought I had the answers, but I don't. So Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then we have this second part of the story where Jesus tells him by what way he would die. Basically, you're going to die um, murdered. Yes. Yeah, and but the question is, did he really know right when he said it? Because mm -hmm. Jesus had had made references to his death, mm -hmm. you know, the three day reference, yes. several times, but the disciples missed it. So I don't, it, I don't. The the part that Peter latched onto, we know, based on everything that happened later, was the follow me. Mm -hmm. Peter latched onto that, but I wonder if he put two and two together mm -hmm. for the the previous part of uh, spreading. Uh, maybe he didn't understand that till later, but mm -hmm. when Peter came to the end of his life and he's, he's on a cross, I'm sure that came to his mind. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, to me that would actually be comforting because it, it, it just reminds you of the, one of the last interactions you had with Jesus in real life and then what is coming. Mm -hmm. Once, once your eyes close, once everything is over, you know, mm -hmm. um, there will be a short sleep, mm -hmm. and then there's a trumpet, and mm -hmm. then you're back with him. <laughs> with him, you amen. know, after amen. The resurrection. Amen. And and maybe the last words that Peter pronounced maybe were, "Lord, I love you." Yeah. I love you. Look, I love you, all the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's powerful stories that. Um, should encourage each one of us to love the Lord, to be compelled to tend His sheep and to feed His lambs. And, and uh, like you mentioned, um, this is a, a comforting um, story for all yeah. of us. And it, you know, I feel like a lot of Peter's life I can relate to, not mm -hmm. just because my name is Peter. <laughs> uh -huh, that's right. <laughs> but like, you know, certain uh -huh. times in my life when I messed up, you know, I can remember mm -hmm. that Peter messed up, but mm -hmm. there was still ministry. And, you know, I should probably know this, but I don't really know his age at this point mm -hmm. going forward. We kind of mm -hmm. all know Jesus' age when Jesus left this earth and went back to heaven with the promise of return. But, like, Peter, he might have been a little older or whatever, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> it gives me hope because, you know, I've, I've just hit 30, and to know that, like, <laughs> going forward... There's mm -hmm. still a lot that can be done. Amen. Um, John, for mm -hmm. instance, he was in his latter I know, 70s mm -hmm. or whatever going mm -hmm. in, and a lot of the most important parts of the Bible right now with revelation, you know, and prophecy, that happened in his later years. So That's right. In, in every, it, it doesn't matter if it's the, the little boy giving his two mm -hmm. um is two fishes and five loaves. It doesn't matter if it's um, Peter kind of midlife um, or, or, or Saul or Paul mm -hmm. in the situation. 
Um, he, he was already well into his ministry. Yeah, that's right. But then he just completely changed. changed. So, like, at all different aspects mm -hmm. of life, doesn't matter how old you are, um, God provides the steps for you um, to take those steps of faith and mm -hmm. that commitment in, in his plan for you. Amen. And, and I think, again, the, the idea of love's um, commitment, um, we can see in each one of these um, disciples and apostles, um, Peter and John and, and Paul, um, you could see that they really loved Jesus. They really loved God. They really were all in. And because of that, they made these incredible commitments um, to sacrifice, you know, comfort, sacrifice even family to a point, to um, go to places where they would be stoned or incarcerated. And, mm -hmm. and still, nothing stopped them. They had a mission to fulfill. And by God's grace, they were going to do just that. Um, we look at um, this question in, in our lesson, and it's based on 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. If you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, I'll ask Peter to read it. The question is for John, love is more than a vague abstraction. How does John define love's ultimate sacrifice? 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Okay, 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Mm -hmm. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need mm -hmm. and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Mm -hmm. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Mm -hmm. So saying I love you, I care for you uh -huh. is one thing, but the actual loving and caring to is, show a whole, it. is a whole other thing. It is a whole other thing. And, and I think this is something the world is desperately needing to hear and see. Um, not just here, but see where we're actually doing this in love. The things that we do, we're not doing it to in any way glorify ourselves or to let people know, look how good we are. But the idea behind all that we do is to um, maybe give others the opportunity we ourselves have received. Wow, what a blessing to know Jesus. We want you to know him. And if we find ways of showing that love to others, I think um, little by little, Hopefully, they'll want to know more about Jesus as well. Um, mm -hmm. Before we close, can yes. I read this last little Please quote? Please do. I think um, this is important. Yes. It talks about, well, I don't know. If you have the lesson, great. You can read the whole page. Or if you have the app, the whole page. But I'm reading the bottom paragraph mm -hmm. here, and it's from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9. It says, In every church there is talent, which with the right kind of labor might be developed to become a great help in this work. That which is needed now for the upbuilding of our churches is the nice work of wise laborers to, dis to discern and develop talent in the church. Mm. So how does that apply to everything from the step of faith to, to Paul's uh, journey to um, the story of Peter that we talked about? How does that apply here? And I would say, Peter, that it applies in that Jesus used fishermen, mm -hmm. Jesus used tax collectors, Jesus used even a persecutor of Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, he can use you too. He can. And, and what we do want to do is develop those gifts and talents God has given us. Um, each one of us is different, but together we can present a beautiful picture of who God is, of who Jesus is. And, and this is the opportunity right now, I think. With all that's going on in our world, this is the moment. If we don't do it now, I don't know what other opportunity we're, we're going to have in the future. It's going to be more difficult. It's going to be more challenging. And I would like to invite you, um, as a little note, to join us for 
Forecasting Hope. It's an evangelistic series we're having here at Tridelphia. You can tune in from wherever you are um, here in North America or in other, another part of the world. It's starting October 9. You just have to go to forecastinghope.org slash Clarksville, the city in which we're in, and you can register there and be part of something great. And my plug right before he prays. Uh, new lesson for next Amen. time. If you want to stop by sometime, we could probably arrange mm -hmm. this to get to you. Uh, there's also the Sabbath School apps that you can um, download that um, already have this. But education, it's the newest uh, lesson. And um, thank you for um, your journey. I know I've been behind the camera most of the time watching you um, fill in these uh, lessons uh, over the past I want to say semester, but I think it's mm -hmm. quarter. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you, that. Peter, for your help. And, and we're going to ask the Lord's blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And again, for inviting us all to feed your sheep, to lead your people, to guide them close to a closer walk with you. And Father, we just ask for your Holy Spirit, just like Peter and John and the disciples, ask for it, we ask for it right now, that we might fulfill the purposes that you have for each one of us. And we give you the glory and the praise, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.